So, Matthew Rook, um, I'm interested in your time as head of music at Scottish Arts Council. What was the situation that you inherited and what were the major fact features of it? Yeah. And then what 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 did you try and do while you were mm -hmm. there? What what were your stars, i.e. your successes and what were your wishes, i.e. things you would have liked to have done but didn't get done? And anything else that comes into your mind? Yeah, well, we're talking about 1991. Yes. So, um, at that stage, I'd been working at the Arts Council in London for two years. And it's a, I always remember the time about making the move because A, it's coming back to Scotland. B, it was in the midst of the first Gulf War. Okay. And, um, you know, so you're waking up to, to news forecasts and it was very strange comparing what the world was like uh, going on around you and then the realities of that work. I'll give you one example of how, how things were in Scotland at that time. My um, boss at that time was Shona Reid. It was only years after I started that Christopher Bishop, who was the head of the Royal um, now Scottish National Orchestra, when it was still the SNO, and uh, he rang Shona Reid and said in his classic plummy voice apparently, Shona, does this mean that we have got to play reggae now? <laughs> what, because you got the job? Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah. Um, so that, that, that to me sums up that um, where people were musically and that... And culturally. Uh, well, culturally. Um, and uh, the other thing was is that my predecessor, Christy Duncan, Christy had been in post for, what, 25 years? Yeah. Right? From the outset. And um, building on that theme... Christie, of course, was born in the West Indies. His, um, wow, okay. his father had been a telephone engineer. And so, you know, if you do that identity picture of one of these people, you know... It's going to push Maggie through. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the West Indian? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so that world... And Christie, you know, Christie had a very clear thing he wanted to do. He believed that the, um, all, you know, all sorts of music were important. He says they weren't priorities for funding. For funding, yeah. Because there wasn't enough money to establish it in terms of when Christie was coming through. You've got to think about that. The SNO was a part-time orchestra. Yeah. When uh, he started. Yeah. You yeah. know, Scottish opera. What is it? 61, 62. Alexander Gibson's, you know, vision. And then that, of course, started to fall ground. Scottish Chamber Orchestra wasn't founded until 1976. So for Christie, um, it was... We haven't even got these things. Sort of consolidated. Yeah, consolidated. Yeah. But however much you can think of that in terms of thinking about how Edinburgh and Glasgow compared to London and Paris and all those things through to it, the net result was is that what may have been a policy which was understood in those circles, it just meant for everyone else that no one's interested in us. All the money's going to one yeah. musical genre. And, and do you uh, remember a percentage number of that when you started? What percentage of the budget was going to inverted commas classical music? Oh, it must be 90, 90 95%, something yeah. like that. You know, huge. Yeah. Um, and that's just because of the infrastructure through to it. And the thing that struck me at that time, one of the things that motivated me was thinking I, I had in mind two Ali Baines. I know one's <laughs> enough. <laughs> but imagine you've got two Ali Baines and you've got the nice genteel. Alistair, and if you look at Alistair Bain's um, musical career, and I, you know, I imagine him as being... A, so there are actually two Ali Bain's? No, no, it's just my thinking. I'm thinking about your know, philosophy through to that, and if you can imagine it, they're, they're, you know, in, in this imaginary game, there's um, young post, posh um, uh, Alistair McGovern McHugh's St. John Bain, who's, a, who's plays the violin, but as a classical musician, yeah. if you imagine that person's trip through life yes. back in that time, 1991, yes. well, what would they have? They would have had schools and an exam system that was all built around expertise in classical music. Yes. And not only would they have that, that system meant that the state was channeling money for teachers and their training to give you these fantastic teachers. Yes. And then when you get to the age of... Um, 1718, the state had decided there will be a conservatoire yes. or university departments. And then all those resources to give you that training for three to four years yeah. come in. And then when you come out, well, 
there's the BBC, there's all of these regional symphony orchestras. Um, there's, and there's also schools. work doing the education. Or go back to the schools again. Yeah, or so, the orchestras. So, yeah. so invariably, in order to be um, supported, if you just happen to make the choice that the tunes that you wanted to play were within classical music, you, you've literally got a lifetime that would deliver, at the end of it, respect, pension, and all the things you'd wish to do. And then you compare that to young Ali Bain, yeah. miles away from any of those systems, not playing a form of music which would then deliver that work through. Yeah, if you can imagine it... Um, I don't need to imagine it. You do. I know. <laughs> <laughs> think it, yeah. But I guess... It's yeah, like... so that whole, that whole process through. So one of the things that motivated me was just thinking... Um, it's kind of, kind of high flown, but my theory on it was based from John Rawls and um, his theory of justice, which was you know how do you spell that? Rawls R R A W L S. Okay. And his 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 model was imagine if you're in the world and you don't know what position in society you'd be in when you wake up tomorrow. Yes. Knowing that, how would you shape? The institutions yes. of your society, knowing that you might end up with me there, okay, or through to I'm that. And if you take that model in terms of music, for me, one thing you might be a jazz musician in the morning, you might be a classical musician, yeah. or you might be a folk musician. So you want to make it so that yeah. whichever one you are, you're going to be okay. Yeah, and also, sadly, um, mediocrity in one of those sectors, there's enough money, in, well, it wasn't in the classical music sector, to sustain mediocrity. The problem is within jazz in traditional music, there wasn't even enough money to start talking about doing things for people who were you know, insanely talented. Matt, can I stop you one yeah. second? I'll just check the shop. Yes. Yeah. It's brilliant what you're saying. It's absolutely perfect. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's one thing. Just about the history of starting, there were social attitudes, uh, and then there was just that history. You know, and part of it was, for, um, for Scotland, even you know, a classic... The classic story of Scotland is coming lately to the party and then wanting to be like the rest of the people there. So, you know... At the, par- at the party. The pa- so, so the party will be, you know, Western, you know, world classical music. To- Having an opera, a house. Yeah, yeah. and uh, all these little things of being a civilised... Sort of statehood. Statehood. Yeah. And in- instead of asking the question, well, do we have to have those things? No, I'm not saying that, we, you know, I'm... I'm against them because I spend so much of my working life now in opera. But it's just saying that process in Scotland, there's that sense of, we've got to catch up, we've got to get them. And the difference is, culturally, um, that within classical music and opera, because compared to the rest of the world, there wasn't enough money going in. You know, if that's your measure, there simply isn't. Yeah. You know, so if you think about it, in, in the problems of things like Scottish opera, Alexander Gibson, absolutely genius. You know, and he had that vision, and I think about it, you know, a country where, literally, a butcher's boy could found an opera company and revitalise an orchestra yeah. and have a world career. Yeah. That, to me, sums up that story in Scotland of where people can come from yeah. and where talent can take you. Yeah. The problem was after that, that those ladders for talent were not there because the beasts that were created didn't have enough to fuel them. So I'll use, use an example on that. Say in the case of something like Scottish Opera, um, to do opera effectively, you really need to be doing 12, 15 operas a year. And the reason why I say that is there will be the core repertoire that people want to see, and if you're developing audiences, they've got to come in contact with it. So you think, yes, yeah, so you've got to do Mozart, you've got to then work through and look at early opera through to that. People also like the full blown, full on grand opera, and then people want 20th century work, and then people say, well, what about supporting new composers and all that work through to yeah. that? And then, You've got productions, and once you've invested all that money in making a production, you hope it's going to be good enough to revive again. Yeah, and some, some, other, yeah. Some, other, some other time or some other place. Yeah, and so with that problem, as I say, the model for saying if you want to do opera properly, it really should be you've got a full-scale uh, symphony orchestra, you've got a full-time chorus, because you need to create that employment for those singers. Because mm. you know, singers have it really tough well. Because they won't be there. Yeah. And you have um, enough repertoire to sustain and build an audience of people who've never heard it before, to nurture new work, and to give people access to the repertoire. And also, you need to keep doing new productions, because 
you know, what, what's the worst thing, if you're playing a jazz gig, you know, the worst thing in the world to do is to be setting up at a show thinking, I had a fantastic gig last night, because you know, <laughs> there's a very good chance that this one is going to be off. You know, it might yeah. be something in the air or cold or, yeah. you know, playing right, you're not sent through to it. Yeah. So if you can imagine, in terms of opera productions, you cannot base your work on the assumption of, oh, we'll do 12 operas, but I can revive all of them. Because actually, you know, on the positive side of things, if you're taking risks... Some of them are not going to be not good. So yeah, good. and other ones might just be bad. Yeah. You know, and you don't want to do them again. So, in terms of where Scotland's yes, classic split identity, in terms of Scotland wanting to be like those other countries, and to have those things, and say, well, if you've got that in Paris, or why can't we have that here? Then it means that you need a really top machine but there wasn't enough money will well, government so, situation think, it's a bit like saying we want to go out and compete in formula one and actually we've got a really lovely little go-kart you know if Lewis Hamilton was sitting in that little go-kart he wouldn't be where he's now so that's that so wasn't so what you're saying is there wasn't even enough money to do that even, properly even, yeah even though classical music absorbed a huge part of that's money it wasn't even enough money to do, to do that seriously properly. Yeah. So that's what it was like when you arrived. Yeah. So they, they, this, I mean, I was aware of there being quite a big shift in yeah. in priorities when you arrived. And do you think that's why you were hired, or was that something that you brought? Uh, I think it was why I was hired. I mean, um, uh, with uh, people noting that you know I was very different to Christie. Uh, and I, I am. And the thing is, though, I went through, well, you know, part of my early life through, for me, classical music was one thing I did, jazz was another, rock was another. Because there was nobody telling me that I couldn't. Yeah. Um, and so, um, for me, what shocked me when I went to the Arts Council was, like, how many, how many people there not only couldn't do the thing that they were administering, but what do you mean by that? You meant they weren't musicians or, or they yeah. were just incompetent yeah. administrators? Well, no, they're not incompetent administrators, but it just, of the one place... They didn't know about what they were... Yeah, in. and the thing about it is, is that if you've not had that experience of being ripped off by somebody, of playing a gig, of not getting the stuff that you wanted through, not being paid, spending the night stuck by the side of the road in a crappy van because you haven't got the money afford to pay that through, and yet you've been playing with some of the top players and people say wonderful things about you, yeah. if you haven't had to live that through, then it may be that when you start making decisions about people... You don't really understand. Yeah. Yes. And so, you know, if, if the Arts Council were a hospital, it would be a hospital where not only are the administrators there, there are no doctors. Right. Yeah. You know, so there's one thing to do with the culture and the experience of actually doing it. And that was when you arrived. Yeah. But you were, you are, you are a musician, you, mm -hmm. you worked in lots of different genres. Yeah. Do you think you were hired to do a particular job or you told I, I was, you should do yeah. this job? Or, was, or did you choose the direction to go no, in? No, I, I think it's a clear agreement in terms of me saying this is what I'm interested in and what to do. Uh, and um, the direction Shona wanted to take the Scottish Arts Council, yeah. and which was, um, ha what are we going to do with all this talent if we don't do something? In, in other genres? Yeah. So, uh, so the changes, I think, you know, key changes I've looked at and made is that um, in, the, in terms of jazz, well, first of all, the principle, which is that belief, if someone's talented and they've got ability, they should be able to have a dialogue with the Arts Council and the opportunity to... Um, with support. Yeah. You know, so you've got to make the field something level, bearing in mind you've got these huge bits of infrastructure, like the equipment of a steel plant, <laughs> you know. That were being funded and yeah. creating a lot of jobs. Yeah. Um, so that was one element. The second element with it just relates to um, the reality. You know, if you look to the figures, the percentages of people, what they're interested in, jazz. The audience figures. Yeah. yeah. You know, jazz, jazz, as much of a minority interest as classical music. Yeah. Similar and, to folk music. Yeah, but the, not the support. And part of it is the attitudes. You know, there are some people who believe that if you gave a grant, it was tainted. You know, and e even on the, on the, the, the further left end of the trad scene, you know, there was that feeling about, wait a minute, if you take their money, you've been co-opted. Yeah, you, know, you sold out to the man. Yeah. Although, I have to share this, when, when I was in London, there was a lovely, lovely uh, story of Kenny Wheeler and asked to explain 
um, what was the difference between going out and playing a series of tunes at a gig and a jazz suite? And which is a brilliant answer. Kenny's answer was a, a jazz suite is a series of tunes connected by the thematic device of an arts council club. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. You know, yeah. So, so, <coughs> so funding, <coughs> yeah. <coughs> funding changes the music a little bit. Mm. People were scared of that. However, yeah, but it, it, it's, it's about status, it's about work yeah. prices, it's about work conditions, it's about creating c- proper career yeah. pathways. Yeah, and, and the opportunity is that. So one of the things that I did, and even, but even within jazz, I know some people didn't think it's very uh, uh, jazz friendly you know, thing to do, but when I looked at organisations like Scottish Jazz Network, I knew what people were trying to do, but I looked at it and just thought, wait a minute, there's um, 50 grand going into that institution, of which the net result of that is employing somebody to then come and lobby me to do more things for yeah, jazz musicians. Right. And so one of the decisions there was, right, why not turn this around and actually give the musicians the opportunity to get access to funds and to do, do that work through? Okay, can I, can I just ask a series of questions? Because I think this, you're covering a lot of ground and it's really great. It's just, it's just about um, pinning it down a little bit. So in the big picture, when you started, yeah. mm. there was like 95% plus money going yeah. to classical music. Yeah. A lot of classical infrastructure, like national bodies, the opera, yeah. the orchestra, all the rest of it. There were, how many orchestras at that point? There were two, three getting funded. Uh, at that point, there was the Scottish Chamber Orchestra yeah. as a revenue-funded organisation, the um, Scottish Opera, obviously yeah. the Scottish Orchestra, Scottish Ballet, yeah, um, and the Royal Scottish National Orchestra at that time. Yes, so there was four orchestras plus the Scottish Ensemble. Yes, all that Scottish Chamber Orchestra. Yeah, they were the SEO. Yeah, they were there. Yeah. So that's like five or six orchestras. Yeah. Or large or songs. Yeah. So, the f- so, so was the first thing you had to do to free up some money to mm. spend on other genres? Yeah. And did you have to then cut something first? Uh, yeah. Some t- it was a ma- the best way to describe it, it was a mixture of things that you cut to create it. So the first thing you can do is open up the rules. So if you've got funding for ensembles, then why not just make that open to whatever work is excellent. Right. The second thing is, are there institutions and organisations which were either in receipt of money that you could move to it? And the other thing too, and this is like an incredible like, this was a time when the economy was rising. Right. And there was more money coming through. So the, the, the budget was going up. And that more of that budget moved over to jazz, traditional music, in the case that was made for it, yeah. that way. And then, where there are organisations, it's saying, well, let's not have the organisation, let's actually make sure we've got the art happening to the level. Yeah, so there was some kind of, uh, like Scottish Jazz Network, that yeah. were kind of middlemen, and you yeah. didn't want to go... <clears throat> so did, I remember you having a conference yeah. fairly early on, yeah. which seemed to me to be important at the time. It felt like you were sort of mapping out, you were sort of trying to engage with the sectors and trying to get a sense of engagement with a new vision is that yeah. what you what it was it's about well first of all it's trust you know if you if you've had somebody slamming a door in your face for the entire history of the arts council yeah it's easy to sit back and yeah oh yeah what's yeah. this one about yeah what's this going to be um, do you remember when that was it in sterling yes yeah, in sterling do you remember when it was 1991 92 so it's fairly quickly after yeah. you started yeah one well, thing i learned from there and advice from shona was if you're going to do anything do it in the first six months yeah um, so you're, one of the first things you did was get did you just sort of try and get everybody in the room? Like, yeah. You know, basically. Yeah. And from that, I mean, you know, it was, it was a great time in the sense that I'd go off and have one-to-one meetings. On the one hand, I'd be meeting with Stan Reeves, and, you know, we'd be talking about the situation is in traditional music. On the other, I'm sitting down with Peter Maxwell Davis and talking about his perceptions. Yeah. But the one thing I found, and this is the, I think the other crucial hallmark, is if you're involved in music, the genres that people are involved in kind of become meaningless because what you both understand is what you can do when you play and if they're good they'll be doing something interesting within that group um so you know i do not see there being problems between forms of music i do think that there are problems between people who themselves aren't really talented musicians well, I mean, that, impose those barriers on I, it. I remember that conference because mm. because roger spence um mm. uh took i think it was myself and john mm. ray and tommy smith he, we had a meeting in advance and we mm. sort of went as a group mm. and Roger, I think, wanted us to go together as a sort of jazz mm. kind of block and there was a sense of, you know, the time's changing, this is a big, things are going to be opening up mm. 
and we need to be lobbying for what what we want to happen, you know. And I remember there being conversations, these interesting kind of breakout conversations where somebody from the class organization was talking about not having enough money or, mm. and we would be going, hold on a minute, you know. Mm. And there was a certain amount of tension around that. Yeah, you know, well, that is, when there's a rule about fairness, I mean, it's like, it's like the tax argument now. Um, you know, when you've got somebody saying, I played by the rules, you certainly did. But yeah. for everyone else, it's saying like, yeah, but the rules are just... The rules are wrong. Me. Yes, the rules right. are wrong. Yeah. And that's the difference. So, um, so, so, so did you just look, think we could, mm -hmm. you know, if you put us in a room and we would see all that, or did you try and have a strategy for getting people to accept that? Because there were some people going to be winners and losers yeah. from your I changes. Thought, from, from that point, though, first of all, it was establishing the principle that everyone had a right to be in that room. Yes. You know, and compared to the past, that wouldn't have been the case. So you get people in the room and you realise it's going to be painful, but the, the backing that I received internally was saying, look, if you've opened up this debate, if I don't have something to give to people, then what's the point? Yeah. Um, so during that time, money for music as a whole increased. And did you get a lot of shit? Oh, yeah. From, you presumably from people you were reducing their... Yeah, or well, even people yeah. gave money to. Yeah, uh, if, 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 Even uh, the point where, um, uh, in that case, the Scottish Chamber Orchestra, and they received this huge increase, got up to about a million pounds. Yeah. And after he did that, there was a phone call from Ian Ritchie telling me how disappointed he was that he didn't get everything he'd asked for. Right, OK. You know, and you just think... Oh. So, so in, in that situation, and I think it comes back to that fault line of... Um, not only was all of the money going into classical music to start with and all of the institutions, but also those institutions weren't funded properly so that they could leave the room. Now, one of the things that, by the time I left, um, I led through a process for the, the government looking at the national companies and their funding. Yeah. Weirdly, when I left in 1996, 97, that financial year, the government invested another 2.3 million pounds in Scottish Opera, Scottish Ballet, the SCO and the RSNO. What they also did was agree to take on their funding directly. Yeah, well, I, I'm interested in talking to you about that because yeah. I, I, well, there's two things I was wanting to sort of drill down into a little bit. One, one is that it seems to me that there was a clear leadership role that you were taking mm. then in terms of cha changing the function and the role of the of the arts council in terms of the way it sat within mm. the cultural life of the nation mm. and the way what in terms of changing its priorities and, and it's interacting with the musical practice that's gone on that's the first thing that you it seems to me was quite clear and the second thing is that um there was a fairness kind of uh, debate happening, and it was to do with money, it was to do with size of audience shares, to do with how much funding was yeah. going, and it seems to. So it's, yeah. uh, let's make it's a two part question. The the first part question is, were you really clear about the leadership role, and do you think that's changed subsequently since you left? In uh, that's the first question. Yeah. The second question is that move of taking the funding for the national bodies out of the Arts mm. Council and making it direct. That's kind of obscured things, I, I think, and I think it was designed to obscure things so that the fairness question was harder to ask. I think Do you think that's true? No, I'll start with that one first. I think it's the exact opposite. Really? Yeah. Um, because we're just talking about music. Yeah. Can you imagine if you're a writer, a dancer, a visual artist, a poet, a crafts maker, and you're the, even you're the director of all of those different things, and I'm sitting there in the Arts Council, they're also saying, not only he ate all the pies, yeah. you know, he's got his cake and he's eating it. And if you're, it's not just about within music. Those, those institutions, compared to the rest of the Arts Council's work at that time, okay. was, wait a minute. Massively, yeah, massive there was, amount of money. There, I, there was probably still more money for jazz, traditional music, contemporary music, than there was in, that, in terms of free medicine institutions for writers. Yeah, okay, I'm really so, right. so the first thing is, by taking the national companies out of the, that situation, it completely changed the debate about how these art forms engaged in what became Creative Scotland. Because what was happening was any, any increases, people, there was a general view saying like, music in general's got too much money. 
you know, instead, if you're a writer, you say, I don't care when it's just on passive. Yeah, but I mean, it, okay, but, it, don't so, think that, but don't you think that... So they clarified it, because what it's saying is, wait a minute, if you want to have access to museum culture, you don't say to the crafts department, well, now you've got to fund the National Museum of Scotland with all those lovely old pots, because they'd say, look, no, that's I, I, I agree that. But if you, but if you're so, going, so that's the point. Well, but Mark, if, yeah. if you're going to, if you're going to ask the question, mm. how much do we spend on uh, museums mm. and well, no, that kind of how much do we spend on crafts compared to or well, crafts compared to football? Yeah, it, it it doesn't make sense to like the biggest spend on on crafts isn't included because it's been moved somewhere else, and we're just talking about this. Um, yeah, you know. it can be, but there's also then the dynamics. I, I would say, of my life and my time, um, whenever I could get the chance to escape um, and get out and go and play with people, then I would do, because these things are like a black hole, right? They suck in everything. They suck all the political energy, they suck in yeah, the yeah. time. And from an Arts Council point of view, so much of the Arts Council's time was consumed with the national bodies, the national bodies. Yeah. That so was no it, it was better, it was better for the. It was better for the. I'm sure it was. Yeah. And I'm sure it I mean, took some of the heat out of it. Give well. you an example, Tom. Just in terms of things that you'd never expect. Part of my role at the Arts Council, for obviously, if ministers were asked questions by members of the public, um, you had to spend your time responding to them. Yeah. There was a co-production, Scottish opera and English national opera, of a work called Life with an Idiot by Schnitke. In this opera, there were lots of three foot long phalluses that people were cool. wearing. Yeah. And examples of that. So, of my time, of things I could be doing, someone wrote to Lord Lindsay. Lord Lindsay, in expert style, turned to the Arts Council to draft the response and uh, provide an answer on why were these phalluses there. Um, why were they there, or why were they three foot long, or yeah. both? Um, you know, and all those reasons, so they could give an answer, so they wanted to do that through to it. Again, be beautiful, beautiful timing. Dennis Marks, <laughs> Dennis Marks, good, good London Jewish boy at that time, running English National Opera. The only thing that he contributed to, to it was that they may have been green, but they were circumcised. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so, so when, when you think, look, if you've got an institution where on the one hand you've got these historic imbalances, you've got all of these people who want to build trust in the organisation, you've got knowledge and expertise yeah. you can use to help people, why am I drafting ministerial letters about, about three phases. foot long yeah. green fallacies? Yeah. Why? Because it's opera, it's yeah. that black hole that sucks yeah. everything into yeah. it. So, so, okay. so, so the point one is, it clarifies the situation because on that basis, if you then start looking at it historically, one, it turns it into a problem that's not going to spill over into the rest of the arts sector. All of the time those institutions have been direct funded by the Scottish Arts Council, if they catch a cold, the first response for government is, well, you have lots of tissues around here. Yeah, okay. I, 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 I really get that. I didn't understand that before. Yeah. So, so that's one. The, the, second, the second point with it is that um, many of the arguments that were going around in that time in the public sector, best way to describe it, early 80s, suddenly everyone discovered marketing. And that was going to find all the solution to the arts. You know, marketing. Yeah. People like Luke Rittner running the Arts Council and young gentlemen with red braces. And yeah. Then it moved on to that and saying, no, it's not that through, um, it's education. And then what happened? All those institutions got their education officers because yeah. education was going to do it. And then, by that time, yeah, through the 90s through to that, it was... Ah, oh, economic development, it's all the added value. And it doesn't matter if nobody from this part of town comes to see that opera because you know, that captain of industry who's going to see this national company and they're going to say, I'm going to create 50,000 jobs in East Kilbride because yeah. they've got opera. Yeah. Or that Scottish opera goes overseas and that government says, my God, look at that. Let's, call, uh, let's, let's buy some of their... You know, ships or something. So all of the time, you know, the thing about it is, to those that have shall receive, and those institutions having that through, and for me the, the challenge is, is that the, the biggest problem for classical music in Scotland has been that it's never been allowed to be just music. And because of all those things on it, that you're saying, you know, as, as you know, if you hear something that's good, I know that looking at Scottish opera, for example, if you go into the pit, the backgrounds of the people in that orchestra, thanks to the investment in the past 
in making education accessible are no different to the people outside. The people on stage singing are no different. The people who are building the sets, painting and decorating, you know, they're exactly the same. So when people say about it being exclusive and about it being elitist, the people creating the art aren't, because yeah. they're artists like anyone else doing that work yeah. through. But somehow there's that social, historic infrastructure and all that goings around it that created some of those barriers of perception. And because it had never been funded properly by government, you're always in a loser. Because it, you know, it's a bit like having this huge, hungry beast Never so, enough. So you basically think you, you you agree with the position that the 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 opera, the orchestra, the these kind of ballet, these are sort of essential badges no, of no. badges of nationhood, which every nation needs to have to be civilized, and therefore no, that just needs to be done. No, I completely disagree. But I think that's what that that's what those times were like, and that's yes. essential working through to it. I would take the opposite position, which we did, um, and in Ireland, when Irish national ballet, as there was. Um, we're in financial difficulties. You know, the Irish brilliant response was, you know, well, do you want a national ballet company or not? Yeah, and the Irish thought, what are we famous for? I don't know, ballet, ballet. Yeah. Cut it. Right. And so again, it comes back to forcing to make those those decisions. And the reality is, audiences are still declining in those areas. And weirdly, um, I mean, I know that my kids listen to more. Um, huge scale romantic classical orchestral music than I did at their age but it's because it's coming to them from Harry Potter from Star Wars yeah. from Halo and yeah. all those games so yeah. strangely the the music again it's not a problem the music's still going still yeah. there. so, so there's, there's, I, I don't agree with that but, I'm saying, but at that time that was the government's policy that was their investment remember those were those weird far distant days when there were Tories you know, still Tories roaming around the glens, yeah. and then just coming into town to you know do their do their stuff before they disappeared again. Okay, so go, let's go back to the first question, which yeah. was about having a clear leadership role. Yeah. Was that something that you talked about and were very clear about? And do you think that's changed since you left? Yeah, I, well, I do, but it's not. You know, I hate those things you see with uh, aged, middle-aged, sad men looking back on the their career and then trying to think like, oh, it's not the way it used to be for me. I think the two differences are, is that um, when I worked at the Arts Council, if you were a jazz musician, a traditional musician, a singer, you knew that there was an individual at the other side of that desk who not only wanted to be sympathetic, but who knew about your world and, you know, uh, well, I'll give you an example. When I left the so did you hire artists, ex artists, or people that performers deliberately? Where well, yeah, my policy was: if people have the skills and the ability, then of course you're going to do that. Yeah. Um, and and the reason for it is that that whole thing about trust and credibility. Because in the end, it's, you know, if it's all just about dispensing money now, you just have a checklist. Yeah. You know, you just fill it in and do that through. So it's all about building trust and building an environment, and people actually believe in that to make it happen. So um, now, though. Uh, what I find is it's a bit like, well, I can see these objectives, I can see these schemes and policies, but you try having a, you know, if you want to describe about what your music's like without playing it, where you're from, the connections through to that, if someone is a generalist and they're not part of that, you can't engage with them. But you, so I, mean, I think there are fewer yeah. people who not only have the ability to do it, but do not go out there and test themselves. I left the saying, uh, left the Arts Council um, over the period, I, mean, I carried on doing some bits and pieces, end of 96 into 97, the first thing I did on leaving the Arts Council was to go into the studio with Sir John Tavener as a soloist, do a recording, that recording became one of the uh, recommended best records of the year in gramophone. Wow. So to me, that's the mark. If you 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 just happen to be a musician who's working in the system. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, there, I mean, there, there's a whole bunch of stuff about being a musician in the system, which we can talk about. Uh, uh, but I, I, I do think that there's um, there's been a apparent. What I understand, I I'm not, I don't know for sure, but I understand there's been a, a worldwide trend for uh, kind of government-based arts funding organisations to withdraw from a leadership role 
and that's something that's not just happening in Scotland and it's happening all over the place and I just wondered if that was uh, the, and, and it's not just an accidental thing, it's a conscious, deliberate, strategic change and I wondered if that had, if that's something you recognised and if that's something that, you, yeah. that started before you left or was on the horizon It was before. coming through and actually the merger of Scottish Screen and Scottish Arts Council was a sign of that and things moved, I noticed from people being generalists and of course, if you're, you know, the, the great pain of Britain is a cast of civil servants who are generalists, who will move from fisheries um, through to uh, tax, through to child policy. Yeah. And we have a ethos in the civil service in Britain, and in Scotland too, of very clever chaps and chapesses who pride themselves on their ignorance and their ability to turn their hand to anything. But what's the positive, there must be a positive reason for that, for those changes. Yeah. So we're talking about going from specialists to generalists, and we're talking about withdrawing from a leadership yeah. role. What, what are the, re, the, po well, the positive reasons for those two changes? The only positive reason I can give is to say, well, if someone's a specialist, you know, then you're into that thing about niches and they're not this through to it. At least I'm open-handed. So they're biased. Because, they're... You know, because I know nothing about opera right. and I know nothing about jazz. I'm yeah. a balanced person. Yes. So, so that's, that's the only positive thing I can say. And also, specialists are challenging. And they're challenging because they've got expert knowledge. And they're a pain in the ass yes. because someone says, "I think you should do X or Y," and then you say, "If you do that, mm, then that's going to create a problem because yeah. if you don't fund that process and that training." So when they you know, talk about saying, "We really should talk about too much complexity," they bring too much complex. I mean, there's been there's definitely been a sort of simplification. Yeah. And like there's right from being thirty or forty funds, mm. there's three, yeah. there's three funds, thirty four application forms, there's one application form, and I can see where that makes processes simpler yeah. and saves costs. But, mm. um, but it's one of the it's one of the big trends that I I, I think it I think it happened much more later after you left. Yeah. But it, um, I just wondered if it was already coming when you. It was were there. coming through. It was yeah. coming. Through. And who was driving it? Uh, I'd, again, I'd say Shona was in part. I mean, two things Shona, which were almost um, in contrast. One was that sense of getting close to the artists and making sure that you're accessible. That's one. The other is in terms of fairness. And of course, once you get into the fairness agenda, then that's very difficult because um, just on that basis, the comment you made earlier about money, I want to express myself um, as a musician and my form of expression is a drum kit. That's kind of manageable within the money I have. I'm a musician, I want to express myself through a symphony orchestra. The same artistic urge, but the other one involves paying for 90 people. Yeah. So all those arguments about fairness can sometimes think, well, wait a minute, you just don't understand that that's the, the case. And the person who says, well, I just want to do my drum work, if they do the drum work, they're happy. They're not going to turn around and say, yeah, but the money you spent on that, I could have done that project 90 times. Yeah. So. Well, yeah. Yeah. Okay, last question. Okay, last question. Last question. Yeah. I know I'm taking the time, and I'm very grateful for this. Uh, it's, but it's going to be quite a broad question. Um, what were the things that you think, like your stars for your time there, the things that you think were you achieved that you that you you know really positive about, and what were your wishes? What were the things that you didn't get to do that you liked to have done? Uh, I think the things that are really successful and have lasted. We're just running through no particular order. Enterprise Music Scotland is still going. That's giving power to the actual individual music clubs to get out and to do their work through, be supported free from that yeah. work through. I think in terms of freeing up money and starting to introduce recognition for traditional music, major, major yeah. contribution. I think creating direct funds for jazz musicians to develop their work is another area. I think in terms of um, uh, commissions and creating new work and recordings, uh, one thing that really sticks through, I was delighted that um, Annie Bain followed the Moonstone project. Annie Bain working with an orchestra, not because they invited him, but because he felt confident that they could do what he wanted. Yeah. Same with Phil Cunningham's Phil's Highlands and Islands suite. Um, so those, those things didn't really work well. I think getting the situation with the national companies to the point where these little abandoned offspring were in terms of government terms were clutched to their bosom and they got to enjoy all of the <laughs> the, 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 the fun of running the fun them, of running them yeah. and, and taking that through areas which in terms of doing more 
Um, so had that happened by the time you left? Yeah, that was it. They probably <coughs> agreed to all the extra money through to that, and then they took on when Nod started. Um, right. The other, um, uh, the other uh, things in terms of regrets through, I think recordings could have been much stronger, and you know, recognizing that that is where most music is heard by people, <coughs> and the development and training for people as businesses. That's you know, I don't have any problems with people spending money on managers. It's just I'd rather you have the money to give to the artist. To Tomorrow. get the service from the manager. Yeah. 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 What's the last thing you'd like to say about, well, about this? When I went in, I was only 27 when I started at the Arts Council. And when I went in and I you know, looked at Christine, I saw it had done, but it was partly saying, you know, you have an older chap, uh, he's you know, sort of those battles of the past, things are really different now. What would make me feel delighted is being in a situation where there's somebody saying, you know, that rook chap, oh, you know, he did those right things through to that. Because that means that things have moved on so much yes. that what I was fighting to create has now become accepted as the norm. Yes. And the crucial thing is, is ensuring that people are in the room. Because the thing about it is, if you're not in the room, you don't have a chance. Yes. Even if you're in the room and you think, but they've got all that money or they've got all that influence or whatever, you're there. And you can say that. And you can say it and you create it and you can change it. So the crucial thing for musicians is to think, in the end, all these big institutions, they're just individuals. And they're individuals who also get tired, who make mistakes, who are, you know, who want to do the right thing and it goes wrong. And if you look at the number of mistakes you make in your own life, you know, if you just think, if you'd made one mistake and then you're out, you would never be as a musician. You'd never work again. You'd never do that through. So it's understanding that even, you know, even making those decisions, you're not all powerful. You're just an ordinary person with inaccurate information, who's tired, who's knackered, who's feeling exposed, and you know, and has got all of those challenges. If you don't treat them as individuals, then they will only treat you as if you are a problem. Yeah. So it's that that's that sympathy and understanding to get in there and to do it. Yeah. And I think that the challenge now, though, for everybody, there's a, there's just two worlds. There's a live world. And then there is a digitally virtual managed world. Yes. And when people realise that's the paradigm shift in our society, then those boundaries between well, whether someone's singing, whether they're reading poetry, or whatever, the, the sheer business of getting human beings out into a public yes. space at the same time. Yes, to watch something. Yeah, and engaging with it, that's the challenge. And I think that will be. And I'm going to tell you that um, uh, just looking ahead to the future. And that's what you do now. Trying yeah. to get people to come out to your theatre. Yeah. 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 And yeah, and it's a huge range. I yeah. mean, literally, we, we had um, two posters up side by side at one point. I just want to take a picture because one of them was Jim Davidson live, and the other one was Tony Benn uh, <laughs> next to each other. Yeah. You know, yeah. and we had another thing where we had uh, a new superheroes movie, but we were also doing De Valkyrie you know, live yeah. with an orchestra on stage. Yeah. And I think you know, the thing about it is those boundaries for, for us. We'd have grown up at that time, but you know, that experience of standing and flicking through a record rack is only just coming back now you know, as a niche experience. So, um, the big challenges are nothing to do with genres. How do you look back on your time at the Arts Council, you know, now? Yeah, uh, I think it's one of the best things I've done. Yeah, and I think really good things have happened out of it. Yeah, um, and the only thing I think though is that there's the, the side of it is that there's a um. A part of the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? you know about the, that part of the Bible, um, and I think that when someone picked one of them up, uh, there was a sort of little ancient Hebrew joke, which was, it's better to give than receive, not. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and probably got their thumb over the knot, and so all these things about Christianity, said, no, 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 because I can tell you, in, you know, in an arts, arts funding system, giving people money, one of the reasons why I wanted to leave in the end, is one of the most soul-destroying right. things that you have to do. Sitting yeah. in judgment on your yes. fellows. Yes. And, and uh, they don't thank you probably they're not no. nearly as much as well, they should saying, do. You know, the person gets all the money, you've never given them enough. Yes. And I, I felt that by the end of it, I was a, a sort of um, uh, anti-matter Mr. Del Monte. <laughs> because, you know, some of those schemes, if, nine, if my customers, my biggest block of customers, would be the nine out of ten people you don't give money to, yeah, you know, yeah, that's true. The people get that money, and so, so that you know, that that signs that pressure. And I think for also for people, you're the man who says no. Yeah, <laughs> you have to get out of there because it's soul destroying. Yeah, 
Yeah, but you did it for a good. You did it for a good seven years. Chunk, and you did a lot of good stuff. Yeah. So yeah, it's good. No, enjoy yeah. it through. All all I will say is is that um, if under the Freedom of Information Act someone ever discovered Bruce Sanderson's trout locks of Scotland, and then looked at some of my summer trips in the midst of all of that horror, they will find a close connection between ah. fantastic festivals and artists. Uh huh. So there was a fishing survival <laughs> strategy. Yeah. Good. Beautiful. Cheers, Tom. Fantastic.